Perfect. Uh, well, thanks for having me up again. Um, and so now I'll be hopefully answering the questions that you had before. So um, my disclosures have not changed. Um, here's the outlay for this. Um, you know, since uh, at the very beginning of my career, I've been very interested in ultrasound. Um, I think as a surgeon, you want to do the stuff that you do, you know, that in, you know enhances our work, uh, enhances how we can help the patient uh, do stuff that we have control over. Um, and as surgeons, we are holding the ultrasound probe. Um, and uh, typically, as you all know, um, uh, I have a big team that works with me, but when the spinal cord injury goes to the OR at two in the morning, the team is me. Um, and so I roll in the machine, I mix the contrast, everything, the team becomes you. Um, and so um, I want you to understand the diagnostic opportunities. Uh, I think it's really exciting. Uh, the role, the potential role in spinal cord injury, uh, and really understand the heterogeneity of the human condition, which I think I cannot overestimate because it's just the more I'm in this in between preclinical and clinical, it is nauseating how simplified, you know, everything is portrayed on, on both sides. So, um, so I'll start with the case here right now, 65 year old female, uh, she came in via the ER. She was actually just riding the motorcycle of her husband that he just acquired around the block and she fell over, boom, nothing. The, the, a standing fall to the ground. She uh, was in Asia A, uh, in level C4. Uh, we did an acute decompression. Um, and Jens, I know what you're looking at right now. The anterior portion was not done by me. So she had, uh, whoever did the surgery, left this gigantic uh, ostified behind. Uh, and that sort of terminated her life, right? Um, and so we decompressed her in the back uh, and did a C2 to C5 posterior laminectomy infusion. So. Um, and so now you have this patient in front of you, right? Asia A, low impact trauma. What do you tell this patient, right? We know that um, there is a quarter of these patients, like we discussed in the previous lecture, that are going to improve. We got it very early. We got it, I think we've been, like, I think we got it on the table like six, seven hours afterwards. So she was, you know, good chances. But again, we'll resolve that. So ultrasound and spine surgery, um, it sends off, and I'll, I'll start very basic. So ultrasound is, is basically like almost like a bat. It sends off, ultra, it, well, everything that this probe does, it, it sort of like it hums into the spinal cord and listen to what comes back. It really produces a sound that we can't hear, um, but it, it, that's kind of what it does. And then it has the echo that comes back, and then it sort of can, re can reconstruct exactly where all these barriers are and what sort of, uh, you know, properties they have. Uh, and by, by using that information, we can put uh, a grayscale image together called a B-mode image. And then obviously we have also Doppler. Doppler is effect, like with a race car, when the race car comes towards you, the pitch goes up and it goes by, which makes a very sort of... Uh, you know, interesting race car sound that I could not make here, otherwise it would be very embarrassing, but I can demonstrate afterwards. Here's the ultrasound probe, again, has uh, sound waves going in there, and then depending on what comes back, we have like uh, each pixel is assigned uh, a different grade, a shade of gray, um, depending on how loud it comes back and depending how long it takes for it to come back. So that's how it's reconstructed. Um, this is what it looks like. So there's a sizable ultrasound of an intact spinal cord, the dura. We see the, the spinal cord, the central canal, the ventral, and then the vertebral body. So you see here is a little bit of vertebral body sticking out there. It was a routine imaging study. On the axial slide, we see everything nicely too. So wonderful resolution. So how do we get into that? So now we can see it in a way that we can see the structure. But in reality, uh, what we are really interested in is, is ischemia, right? Because uh, as we've seen in the previous le lecture, with spinal cord injury, the spinal cord doesn't get enough blood. And the tissue ischemia is correlated with poor outcomes, both in brain injury and spinal cord injury. Ischemia drives secondary damage. These are monkey experiments, and you can see how 48 eight weeks afterwards, three weeks, three, eight days, three weeks, is these are the levels of apoptosis. So after your spinal cord injury, approximately 40% of your spinal cord, or like in my paper was 25, 25% of the damage is still to come. So, and spinal cord injury uh, decreases uh, the flow and the flow decreases in a linear fashion with the injury severity. So the more, the, the harder the injury, the less blood flow you have. Um, 
And there's no quantitative biomarker right now. Uh, in contrast to brain trauma, where we do CTPs, we don't have that in the spinal cord. So what are we looking at right now? Here's an ultrasound, uh, a Doppler ultrasound. It's a super resolution uh, image here right now of a sagittal image of a spinal cord, rat spinal cord. Uh, what we're interested in is that area in the middle, right? The capillaries, those big vessels, they're nice to see, but I'll show you afterwards. They're not very valuable for us, right? Um, and I'll show you why in a, in a moment here right now, but we want to look in there. How much blood is the tissue getting? Not the big arteries, right? We, we, we want to see the local traffic, right? The imaging of the capillary bed is not feasible using Doppler because the blood flows so slow and there's so much tissue movement that you can't peel it out with normal Doppler. Um, because the microvasculature, that's where the oxygen exchange and the nutrition exchange happens, has the biggest blood volume and the blood flows very slowly there. And so this is where my physicist comes in, uh, Dr. Bruce. Um, so he has done a lot of work in, in tracking these microbubbles. And the microbubbles is talking about signal to noise ratio is just incredible. You can track individual bubbles. In fact, in the, in the OR, and I'll show you some videos, you can look at individual bubbles. You can even name them. You cannot name them. There would be too many. But, but if you could, AI could probably name them. It would be an overload probably of the surgeon, but um, AI probably would do that first. Um, so it has a shell, it has a core, and again, the, the contrast is, is nothing but stunning. Here's a, a rat, and what else, uh, rat sort of sagittal images, what else we can do is we can track them individually, and these are separated by speed of inflow. So this is slow traffic, regional, <coughs> middle, mid flow, and these are the fast flowing arteries, right? So here, and you can see how you, when you separate that into velocities, you can suddenly see where are the highways and where is the local traffic? Um, and I'll talk about both what we do in my laboratory as well as what we do in the clinic. So in the, in the laboratory, we have a high frame rate um, image. And again, I won't go into details. It works a little bit different from the one that we use in our patients. But what we can do with that is each of these bubbles can be assigned a center, then you can track them, and that's how you get these super resolution images. So 20 years ago when I did my PhD in Stockholm, this is an image that I would have taken, you know, like weeks and weeks to generate, I would have done histology, then stitched them together, a little bit of Photoshop, a little contrast magic, and boom, you know, two, three months later, I would have had this picture. Um, but this is not what we routinely do, and, and it's really interesting to see. So one thing is that you can see here right now is you have the baseline spinal cord injury, the acute, and then the three days afterwards. And you notice that these vessels are getting bowed away. So there's an, an incredible mass effect happening in this spinal cord. And the, the really coolest thing, and that's not cool, but I mean, like, it's really interesting, and I don't know what to exactly make with that, is in, at least in the rat, and I have no reason to believe that it's not like this in the human, um, the, the vasculature looks different in the cervical spine versus the thoracic spine. So if you look very, very carefully right now, you look, you see how the vessels sort of go from, this is ventral, dorsal, they go caudal. You see that? They're from vent, rostral, caudal. In the cervicals, in the thoracic spine, they go rostral. See that? They have the opposite direction. And what that does is the expansion of the injury is different. And we're kind of a little bit unfortunate right now. It'd be nice if it would be the opposite. But in the cervical spine, the segment above the injury gets destroyed versus in the thoracic spine, the injury expands caudally only. Wouldn't it be nice if it would be the opposite, right? So the patient without that red zone that expands within the first three days would have probably an additional segment there. So there's a real reason that we should be all starting to think, what can we do about this mass effect, right? And if anybody's good with mass effect, if we are good at anything, then we're good at mass effect, right? Surgeons, right? That's the only thing we can really do, right? Um, and so it's really amazing that, that, that this is different success. Um, um, and again, uh, I have seen the, the vessels, they seem to be oriented very similar in, in, in humans too. So there's no reason to believe that it's any different, the expansion of the hematoma. Um, again, we talked about that before, I'll, I'll jump over that. But again, the problem with the ANSCII exam is like transient neuropraxia, TBIs, drug intoxication, pharmacological sedation. So in, in many cases, you don't get a really good exam. Uh, and so this is why we started to work with ultrasound here right now. And the rodent, um, we can see that area in the middle of the spinal cord that is depleted of perfusion. So there's this core in the middle with the indicator of the green area that doesn't get any blood. Those were our initial studies where we were like, oh, they look at the injury. It's interesting. There's no blood there. Okay. Um, 
But uh, we can see the same thing in patients too, right? So if you look at this exam here right now, so this is an imaging of a patient. This is rostral, this is caudal. You see the hematoma here. And you can see how this area just doesn't get any blood there in the middle, right? Um, so interesting, right? So we go from, we can see the damage. 99% of all biomarkers in spinal cord injury assess the degree of damage and don't assess the degree of what's left. It would be like brain trauma, oh, 80% of your brain is destroyed. Well, fantastic, right? You want to know how much is left, right? Um, and so this is uh, brought up to, you know, we can look at this here right now, and we just recently published that, um, that the degree of loss in a rodent is highly predictive of the hind limb locomotor function. And very similar in a patient pool pet population, the area of perfusion area deficit is much larger, that deficit in patients that are complete. And again, here's at six months, uh, the red points are patients that subsided to their disease. But you can see that there's a clear, clear, uh, highly significant correlation to uh, the size of, of the deficit but the cool thing is now that we can also look at what's left, right? I'm European. We are very pessimistic all the time. So I wanted to turn it around and show Jens, yes, we can do this, Jens. You know, we don't have to be always so cynical and pessimistic, right? Just because of our European upbringings. And so now we're looking at the positive stuff. Spinal cord perfusion index. How much blood goes in there, right? How much blood do we have in there? Um, we did that in rodents. Again, it's almost to the dot the same that it predicts the outcome. And we did that in our patients. Um, very, very similar. Again, we just look at proportional, how much contrast gets into the injury center versus the periphery. And you can see the proportional inflow is much lower in completes than it is in complete spinal cord injury patients. And again, uh, plotting it onto the Asia grade is Asia A patients have almost no contrast getting into that area. So those are Asia A's, almost no contrast getting in there. And so that gets us back to the case. And so that we finish on time here right now. So 65 year old female, remember, she was just desk driving the, the, the motorcycle around. She recovers sensation uh, on day, th uh, I think day three, she starts to move her intrinsics and lower extremities, just the toes, she started to move a little bit, but she was a go and get her. She was like, you know what, if I, if I don't recover completely, I don't want to live. That's it. And they pulled the plug. Uh, given her numbers, uh, I think she would have probably ended up with an Asia D or something like that. So I tried my very best. And the, the problem is like when you have these, it's not, you know, it's not, there's no multi-center trial. You can't only say so much or you can only be very supportive. But um, I think she would have recovered really well. So that's... Um, I owe it to this patient to bring this, this research home so that we can say that, you know what, I think you have a pretty good outcome. Look at her. She had very, a very little perfusion deficit. And that is very different from a patient like this, right? A 33-year-old male, uh, he jumped and he did one of these things into, uh, they, they, to do figure jumping and then jump into an area with little plastic balls. Um, and he, the fittest guy in the world, but he must not have paid attention. He just landed on his head and snapped his head, flexion distraction injury, had Asia C7. And, um, and this patient uh, had almost nothing there. Had a corpectomy, had retropolitan there. And you can see he has almost no perfusion. And another thing that you might, uh, the astute observer here might, might find here right now is, hey, wait a second, that perfusion looks very different from the other patient, right? Don't you see that? There's much fewer bubbles that get in there. My physicist said that the, the injections suck. I don't think so. So I think there's more to it. There's more to it why there is so little blood volume in the spinal cord. Coming back to our rodents, I think there's something else going on there with the spinal cord. We see that in very, very sort of severely injured patients that the contrast just doesn't make into spinal cord as well. But the same, same uh, thing. And here's side to side, Con improved to Asia C. Uh, SPI was 0 0.46, almost 0 0.5, 1.8. So half of the perfusion from the other patient proportionally. So raising the questions here right now, ultra early decompression, which of those two patients would have benefited from this? Neuroprotective interventions, optimal blood pressure management, right? A patient who has like a ton of blood getting in there, are they really helped by, by us pressing them? 
enrollment in clinical trials, right? Those two patients are both Asia A patients, but one of them is probably not going to improve. The other one is going to improve. So Asia A is not Asia A. Rehab planning, right? Patients, that's the first thing they want to know. What's the prognosis? What do I have to do? And uh, that comes to the conclusions. The high frame rate ultrasound can really look uh, at perfusion at a high, um, at a high sort of like uh, spatial uh, determination and sort of like um, resolution. Uh, there's an incredible variability in patients. Um, there is a really good potential of this as a biomarker um, to kind of immediately know where the patient is going to go. The next steps are multi-center validation of this biomarker and to develop tailored interventions for, um, that are appropriate for the perfusion patterns. And again, if you want to read more, we actually got the cover on translational science just a couple of weeks ago, which was exciting. Um, and the same thank you, Kurt. Thank you. Congratulate you. Not only have you taken the endoscopy world uh, further with your very thoughtful and step-by-step -step thing that even old guy like I can understand, but also spinal cord injury. This is a wholly new perspective that you're opening up. Practical questions. So we have one of those, I don't want to mention the company name, but we have one of those ultra high frequency ultrasounds here and I love it, but there's one clear problem. I can't use this anteriorly, I have to use this posteriorly. So are we for severe cord injuries now always going to go posteriorly as long as we have these dimension of uh, shoes and uh, sensor probes? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, as we know from Vijan, I think, you know, I like to go posterior really any time of uh, incomplete because of the swelling to decompress. So I, I almost stopped. I do front backs like I did in this case, but I almost never do an only front. In a neurological impaired, I almost do, always do a posterior decompression. Um, uh, so I think that has changed a little bit. Uh, but there's also a probe, uh, a company that I cannot name, uh, because uh, the first letter is after A, uh, and then the second letter is something else. Um, and they actually have a minimal invasive probe that you can get into uh, the, the disk space. I think we have the same company, but I don't know the probe. We have to talk later. We we'll talk more. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how does the ultrasound signaling now, I think you mentioned that briefly, but just for the slow uptake people like myself, how does MRI signal and ultrasound imaging perfusion deficits correlate, especially T1, T2, uh, high versus low signal uh, images? So MRI imaging of the spinal cord is, you know, the resolution is just very poor. So there is only one study where they did, uh, actually they did, they did CT perfusion studies on a, on an, on an, on a, on a on a, on, an, on a spinal cord. And there's so much artifact that I think the only way right now with technology to look at meaningfully at, at, uh, at the spinal cord is, is a handheld probe where you just have it in front of you. It also makes the most sense because this is the first time the spinal cord sees air, right? I mean, like, it's compressed. So anything before surgeries is useless. I mean, you could have the, the magical Jens magnet uh, with 47 Teslas, uh, higher than their, their H index, uh, and, uh, and, and, and then you, you still wouldn't see anything because it's all compressed, right? Um, and so I think for the first time after surgery, it's decompressed and you see it in its best possible configuration. I don't think it can get any better than that. So I think we really, surgeons are sitting at the, there's a golden opportunity for us to be, because we're right there when it happens, and we have the tools. And it's very standardized. And as we know from Bijan, we should come from the back anyhow in most cases that have neurological deficits. So I hope that this really becomes a standard you know, protocol and marker for us so we can stratify our patients for trials, we can stratify them for outcomes, and talk the same language. Yeah. Must underscore that. So this is a must get if you don't have it yet, this particular uh, tool from this particular company that uh, first letter starts after A. So very cool <laughs> stuff. But thank you for uh, uh, sharing your uh, outlook and congratulations. Awesome. Thanks, Vince.